Thank you, Brenda. And um, hello, everyone. Um, my colleague, Ranjani, is going to go into a lot more details about the technical overview of all these different components that uh, David talked about earlier and Zach demonstrated to you. I'm going to focus um, a little bit about the usability aspects of the, uh, the, the mobile application and then hand over to Ranjani on to get into more of a technical overview of the different components. So for a mobile application, went a little bit ahead, okay. So one of the things when we, when we were designing the mobile applications, both on the iOS and Android, uh, we naturally stayed within the functionality. We used the re Apple Research Kit framework for the iOS application and the Research Stack framework for a lot of the functionality on the Android application. Um, so within staying within sort of the functionality provided that and extending it, um, as Ranjini will talk about a little bit later, um, and also staying within the regulatory compliance requirement, uh, we wanted to design the app with the consideration that research participants, whether it's clinical research or any other research, are not using these apps in isolation. Um, their experience and expectations of using these apps is essentially shaped by a lot of the consumer applications that they're using every day, sometimes many times a day. So it was important for us as we were designing these um, applications that we have user experience and user interfaces that are intuitive, that are convenient, and that really have provide that happy look and feel, which is what they have come to ex expect now as they use multiple um, applications on an everyday basis. A lot of time they're running their lives using these applications. Um, so we really use the mobile first design practices um, and adhere to a um, lot of the common best practices and design methodologies for the UX, UI uh, design. Uh, some of the key considerations, naturally, this is, this is a generalizable system um, that is going to be adopted and used for multiple types of uh, studies, uh, research across multiple uh, populations. Um, so as we were looking at the considerations from a user's perspective, uh, we try to sort of keep a broader uh, view of who is using the system, when are they going to use it, and why and where they will use it, rather than really focusing on one particular uh, user group or demographics or age group or uh, factors like that. Um, some of the other factors we took into consideration naturally are uh, things like screen loading times and faster response times for user actions, because um, if 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 the rose response times are slower, they are not optimized. Uh, if the user action flows as they are going through, whether it's the consent or the surveys or the active tasks, if those are not optimized, then the users will tend to get frustrated and sort of not um, enjoy the experience of participating in the re in, in these studies. Um, the throughout the design process, we use uh, rapid prototyping and continuous user testing, uh, giving sort of ability for the, the actual users of the app, the, the participants who are going to participate in the first study, um, the ability to, to sort of touch and feel the applications and provide uh, feedback on that. Um, the next aspect um, I'm going to talk about briefly is the, the offline capability. Uh, this is something that has come up as questions before. So, the application provides, the mobile application provides the participant ability to take um, study activities on, offline. Um, the, the questionnaires and the active tasks and all the sort of the, uh, the required data is downloaded to the uh, application so it can function in an offline mode. Uh, there is local notifications that are generated for, for reminders um, in, in, in case there is a loss of network connectivity. And all the data is stored, response data is stored locally in an encrypted fashion on the device and then um, transmitted to the server um, when connectivity is restored in case there is a, there is a downtime. And, and all the sort of the design of the network calls between the device and the backend servers is 
done to ensure that there is no uh, loss of data uh, in, the, in terms of any network connectivity. One other factor that I will point out is that all the user data, including any study data, is cleared out when um, somebody physically signs out from the application or there is a session expiry or the app is deleted and uninstalled. Um, or the account is deactivated. Um, all the user data is cleared out if the uh, user leaves the study or withdraws from the study. So there is no, um, there is no uh, trace of any of that data, uh, even though even in an encrypted fashion on the device in that case. Um, there are a number of other usability features that are on this slide. I'm going to um, pause for about 25 seconds to give people an ability to read through these. And then I'll, I'll touch upon a couple that re I really want to highlight uh, over here. So one question, um, uh, a couple of items that I want to touch upon is, as David mentioned and as Zach talked about, um, there is um, an ability, inherent ability within this platform to, to essentially for you to white label and apply your branding. Um, naturally, you can update the content um, as Zach showed in the WCP, but you can also uh, update the images and the, the branding and the white labeling and, and really make the application your own um, by providing that um, branding experience. Uh, there are uh, notifications and communications and reminders throughout the application, both at the gateway level as well as the study level, um, which really uh, provide sort of a clear tracking of the completion status uh, for all the different activities uh, shows what are the open activities are, what are paused, and and uh, continuous sort of sends reminders um, to uh, to make sure that experience for the user is eased. Um, one question that had come up uh, is about ability for um, any kind of patient reward aspect. Currently, uh, in right now, the platform does not have that, but it can be extended um, to add that patient payment or gift um, app um, capability, or it can be connected to an external system uh, to uh, sort of provide those capabilities um, and enhancing the experience from, from the user perspective. Um, and naturally, if there are questions on any of these usability features, we are, we are happy to um, touch upon those uh, when we do the Q&A session. The last sort of the usability aspect I'm going to talk about is the compliance. And, and this is really I'm talking from the mobile application perspective. Um, Adam um, is going to talk about and, and Stuart from LabKey, uh, from more from the backend uh, infrastructure perspective. Uh, from the mobile app perspective, as you saw in uh, the demonstration, there is a secure registration and sign-in process. Um, the passcode and touch ID and face ID is required. Um, essentially, for any any period of inactivity, um, however small, when they come back, when the participant comes back to the app, it requires that um, passcode or, or touch ID or face ID. All the data is encrypted at rest and transit, so anything that's on the device is encrypted. And my colleague is going to talk a little bit more about what those encryptions are. Um, and then, um, again, there is no uh, identifiable information that is transferred when the responses to activities and active tasks and all those are um, sent to the response server. There is no part identifiable, part identifiable participant information that is tra transferred. So I think that's something that is really important uh, from a privacy uh, perspective. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, hand over uh, to my colleague Ranjini, who's really going into a lot more details from a technical architecture perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Sham. Hi, everyone. This is Ranjini again. So looking at this slide, so this was the slide that 
uh, Zach had also um, gone over a few, you know, some time ago. Uh, we are going to be focusing as a part of this, you know, the, the session, we are going to be focusing on the various technical components of the slide uh, one at a time. So you will see the slide come up multiple times with the relevant section uh, or relevant component highlighted or called out. So we are going to talk about the mobile app data flow. Um, so we have two mobile apps or two native apps, iOS and Android. Moving to the next slide. Um, so, so the mobile app is really central to the whole um, platform. And when I say central, that is, it is through the mobile app that the communication happens to both to, to the WCP, the user registration server, and the response server. And all the communication is through JSON-based uh, RESTful web services. Uh, we will be going into the server components in a little more detail um, in a bit. Um, the app uses AES-256 for encryption of data, as you can see. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things to, um, to um, also mention, which is interesting, is the data is stored locally using the Realm database, which is an object-based database. So for it to accept, parse, and process um, JSON-based response is, is efficient from that perspective. Um, the other, um, the other aspect is that the mobile app actually um, has a very robust offline capability, and that means offline in terms of allowing the participants to take surveys, even if they're not connected to the network, to complete the active task if they're not on that network, and also to store the responses and send it to the response server when network is available. Um, one of the things that the app does do is it makes sure that all the offline data or the response data is deleted uh, once the sync happens. So it has pretty robust offline capability. Um, the other feature is that there is function, there's a feature developed into both the iOS and the Android platforms to not allow the app to be installed on jailbroken or rooted phones. So that was something that was put in as a security measure. It's, it's pretty standard, but I just wanted to call it out. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is uh, the study metadata I wanted to bring up was um, the WCP allows you to version studies. So for example, if a survey question has changed or if you need to you know, add a new active task, um, you would update the study on the WCP and it would get a new version. The mobile app on, on launching, when the app is launched, it would get information from the study metadata server, which is the study um, uh, web configuration portal web service, which would inform the mobile app if there is a newer version of the study available. And if there is, the mobile app would download um, the data or, or the metadata of the study for the latest version. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so a little bit on the tech technology stack here. So pretty pretty standard iOS components, um, but the main one here is the Apple Research Kit, and we will we have a whole slide devoted to the re Apple Research Kit. But essentially, we use um, uh, we are using Swift and Xcode, um, and um, uh, the user notification wanted to call out, call out is used for local reminders. So, for example, if I'm, a, you know, um, when when the app downloads the study metadata for the surveys and the active tasks, it it looks at the metadata to figure out when these tasks are due or when the questionnaire or the surveys are due, and it creates local reminders on the device. Uh, this happens for both um, iOS and Android. And these local reminders show up as notifications to the user, um, ha asking them to, you know, either take a survey or complete a task. Um, so that that is um, a feature that was built. And there was a question uh, that had come up around this from one of the uh, from one of the attendees. So I wanted to call that out. Um, uh, the other interesting piece is the health kit. So there is no equivalent of the health kit. Um, on the Android platform that we have built as built out, but the iOS platform has integration with Apple's Health Kit. The Health Kit um, uh, collects different health-related data 
um, on the user's phone, and that is essentially the health app. So um, the uh, the mobile app here can integrate directly with the health kit and pull data, uh, provided the user gives permission to the app. Um, that is a user step. But once the user allows the app to pull data from HealthKit, a lot of the elements can be pre-populated. For example, if I have a survey question that um, needs to track how many steps I have, you know, I have covered in the last two, you know, 24 hours, we could pull it directly from the HealthKit. Um, so that integration makes it easier, or at least it makes the data collection uh, less onerous on the patient. Moving to the next slide. Um, Android, um, again, um, pretty, uh, you know, uh, the standard Android technology stack. Um, some of these, when, when we developed, uh, when these apps were developed, uh, it was, uh, these were the latest versions available, and we upgraded some of these recently, too. So it's being kept pretty up to date, which was one of the other questions that had come up. So. So, so going a little bit into the detail, so um, the, there is um, the research kit equivalent on the Android platform is the research stack. Uh, the research stack is um, not managed by a company as such, but by a group of people belonging to different organizations, universities. Um, so we, so, so uh, there are many features in research kit that are not available in re, on research stack. So we had to extend the research stack a little more than we had to do the research kit to kind of make them uh, similar in terms of the features they offer. Uh, so a lot of extensions that are available by, a lot of features that are available by default on the research kit have had to be built on the research stack. And um, uh, we will go into that in a, a couple of slides. So coming to research kit, so, so, so really the whole the whole uh, the, the backbone or the foundation of the you know of the, the survey based and the activity based um, um, uh, flow that the user goes to on the mobile app is built using Apple's research kit. Um, so as of now, we are on research kit 2.0, and um, the research kit framework is what is used to build the enrollment, the informed consent, the surveys, and the active tasks. Um, also, ResearchKit is an open source framework which allowed us to extend it to provide um, additional functionality. So some of the extensions that were built in into the mobile app, um, we had to build a custom active task. So ResearchKit has, has its own um, menu of active tasks that it provides to, to developers to make use of. But, it, but there's also uh, the ability to create your own custom active task, which we did as a part of this um, effort. And you, you will see the code in GitHub for this active task. Um, also, the eligibility step on the default research kit framework um, was question-based. That was extended to make it token-based. Um, and this has to, and you would have seen the token-based functionality that Zach walked us through. So the research kit framework was enhanced or extended to allow for enrollment token verification um, to determine eligibility. Um, there's a repeatable form step, and I'm going to describe this in just uh, just a bit. So, for example, if um, as a as a participant you need to add, uh, you know, what medications you're on, for example. So if you add one medication that is on a form. Um, the default research kit framework really allowed you to um, have only one or have one form at a time. If they had to add multiple form medications, you would have had to actually go through multiple screens. So we extended the framework to allow them to, um, to really submit multiple forms just by uh, clicking on an add more button or something analogous to that. Um, the response data uh, that is captured using research kit is converted to a JSON format that is sent to the response server. So one of the things um, that um, uh, that was important as a part of this project is to make sure that the JSON templates that we're using, both for the study metadata and for the response um, responses, had to be as flexible as possible 
to allow for uh, future enhancements. And by future enhancements, I'm referring to you know different question types, different kinds of active tasks. So um, so the JSON formats are pretty flexible in that for in from that perspective. So moving on to the next slide. Um, so coming to research stack, so the research stack, um, like I mentioned, was had fewer features and needed more extensions in the research kit. Uh, for example, the the consent, which uh, the consent form, the signing, uh, you know, uh, displaying the consent, getting this consent agreed to and signed by the patient, um, that had to be built out um, uh, as a custom um, component on research stack. Uh, you see a few other uh, custom components there. I'm not going to go through each of those, but um, um, they, they pretty much cover uh, the different question types or the, the survey type, survey question types that were, that were provided in the app and support was built in for research stack. Uh, here's a few more. Uh, so, so Coming to the second one, um, the extended text choice question type to support regular expression. So, so this was really being able to validate the user input using regular expressions. Um, and one of the questions that we saw um, come up was in terms of you know assuring data quality from a patient input perspective. So a lot of rules were written. Uh, data input was restricted either based on data type or it was restricted based on um, you know the length of the number of characters and also validated using regular expressions. So that was um, that was the feature that was built into research stack. Um, the other one, um, the first one, the fetal kick counter active task. So research stack does not, the default framework does not have any active task. So the fetal kick counter built out a whole new active task um, uh, component as a part of the research stack framework. Moving on to the next slide. Um, and now we're going to talk about the WCP, the web configuration portal. So the, the, the main, um, one of the things when we were envisioning uh, not not necessarily the, the features or the functions, but the flexibility and the extensibility of what we build out, right? So from a functional perspective, it was important to allow multiple studies to be launched quickly without um, you know, developer intervention or without technical effort. So, so that was a very important functional feature. Uh, to make it flexible from a uh, from from a from a technical architecture perspective, we had to um, we had to look at it very carefully in terms of what are we building now and what needs to be built out in the future, and and a couple of areas that that became very important um, from a technical perspective was really the exchange of the data, uh, the exchange of data between the study configuration portal and the mobile app between the mobile app and the response server and between the mobile app and the registration server. And the reason this is important is surveys um, can have multiple question types that can, new question types can be added over a period of time. Um, active tasks are even, even more um, uh, uh, flexible or even the unknown in the sense that you literally could add any active task. So one of the things that was taken into consideration as a part of building this platform is trying to make the structure of the data being sent back and forth as flexible as possible to allow for um, new components or new types of, of um, surveys and active tasks to be added. So that was, um, that was an important consideration as a part of this platform. Um, the other, um, there are a lot of other points that have been made here. So, um, and, and many of them, I'm, I'm probably not going to go through all of these, but um, one of the things to call out is um, um, the, the research kit framework allows, um, uh, allows a way to kind of, you know, either uh, use certain modules or not, like the eligibility, the consent, or the survey module. So we, we replicated that to some extent on the WCP by allowing, allowing the 
study administrator to to enter content related to specific modules um, and how they would choose to have that module show up on the mobile app. So moving on to the next uh, slide. So again, we are back to the data flow diagram. And as you can see, uh, the WCP, that, that feeds the data into the mobile app. Uh, and the data that it feeds is the study metadata, which is the surveys and the active tasks. And the WCP also, um, um, the study metadata of the WCP is also used by the response server to map the user response to the questions. And uh, Adam will talk a little bit more about that um, after, um, after, after me. Um, so here's the tech stack. There were a lot of questions on the tech stack. So here it is, um, a pretty standard tech stack, all open source um, components. Java, Spring, jQuery, Hibernate, uh, Tomcat, Linux, um, and the MySQL database. I think one of the questions that we had was on the version of the MySQL database. And I just wanted to mention that um, the development of the platform started um, a little more than two years ago. Um, but we are updating many of the components to the latest um, uh, version, um, if as needed and as feasible. So we would probably be upgrading some of these as um, at some point in the future. So um, the user registration server. So this is the this is the server that actually holds on to the user information that is being provided. And by user, we mean the mo mobile app user. So. The user reg uh, registration holds on to the profile data of the user. It also um, stores the user preferences and um, the study-related status. And what that means is when you, um, when um, on the mobile app, the user can see the dashboard. Um, the dashboard shows them what percentage of the study is complete, if you recall from Zach's presentation. Information like that in terms of completion status all of those are um, stored on the user registration server. So this is not the response, but this is just the percentage of the study completed is stored on the user response server and shown to the user. Um, there is no, again, to reiterate, there's no user response data stored in the server. It's completely isolated. Um, the other thing, uh, interesting thing about the user registration server is it sends out push notifications because this server actually has the device token or the device ID of the user, which is required for sending push notifications. But the actual push notification in terms of the rules uh, that determine when the push notification gets sent out and the content of the push notification is actually defined on the WCP. Um, but the WCP has no user information. So what that means is that the WCP pushes the the metadata about the push notification to the user registration server. The user registration server then runs logic to determine which participants or patients are eligible to receive the push notification. And, and it sends the push notification uh, because it has a user's device token or the device ID. So that is, um, that is one interesting feature of the user registration server. So the user registration server is built on the LabKey framework, the LabKey platform. And um, the reason, the, um, the main reason for that is since it is handling user data or patient data, um, we wanted to build it on, um, on a framework that is compliant. Uh, so it was built on the LabKey framework. Uh, each user is assigned a user ID and also an access token. So for the length of their session, the, of um, whatever the, the time may be, 30 minutes or some configurable time, the access to token is valid. And uh, the web service um, carries the, the access token as a part of every request. Uh, that is standard web services security practices. Uh, so all the communication between the mobile app and the user registration server is through web services. It also stores user preferences such as notifications on or off um, and whether they want to receive, I think, um, information on study resources. 
So there are different kinds of preferences that the user can manage in their mobile app. And those preferences are stored on the user registration server and, and pulled by the mobile app from there. So coming to the, uh, the technology stack, so um, it is again, um, it's built on the Lapkey platform and Adam, um, uh, after, after I'm done, Adam will talk a little bit more about that. Uh, it, it uses Apache Tomcat and Postgres um, database. Um, the JSON format is, is, um, is the structure of the data being exchanged between the mobile app and the user registration server. So, so before, um, so here is kind of the over, overall architecture in, in totality. So one of the, uh, the important pieces that, that, that I wanted to highlight as a part of this architecture was the separation of the three or the four different components, right? So at the heart of it, we have the mobile app. So the mobile app is where the user um, you know, sees the list of studies or sees a single study. The mobile app is where the user registers for a study and also submits their responses. Um, looking at the the different components, what was what was considered um, very important was not to mix or not to uh, you know to build kind of walls, so to speak, between portions of the. Uh, of the application that really do not need to know about each other. So the web config portal is, is purely study-related information. It has absolutely no information about the user. So it is almost like a content management system to use a very, um, you know, to use a common term or a very a simplified term for what it is. It literally is used to manage the study content. It is used by, um, you know, researchers, by study managers, by people in an organization. Um, but all the information that it is dealing with is is uh, non-confidential information. So, and there is absolutely no information or or communication between the WCP and any of the other servers. So that 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 is like one part. Um, then we have the user registration server. So we talked about that, but the user registration server handles the user data, and it lives in its own compliant environment, and it also does not have any um, communication with uh, the response server or the web config portal, except for one that I had mentioned. The metadata about the push notifications is sent from the WCP to the user registration server. So that is so that is how the user registration is also isolated from other components. So there is no link between the user and the response. They are completely decoupled. Um, and it is only the mobile app that really has access to all, all of these three. So if you see in, in the diagram above, the mobile app then uh, the responses that are um, that are provided by the patient as a part of this survey is for a particular user is sent to the response server. The response server is a LabKey server. The LabKey server takes the responses and it also gets the metadata about the study so that it knows which question maps to which response and it puts all of those together and Adam will go over that in a bit. But the the main um, the main aim of this whole architecture is to isolate components that not only that they that they don't talk to each other, but there is really no way that any data can spill over from one into another. Um, so here is um, so so we have all the code is open source. It is present in GitHub. Uh, we have also put up instructions on how to, um, you know, how to run, how to run the various, uh, uh, how to run the different code. Um, you know, please feel free to try that. I know we have, you know, we have got a few questions um, that have come up on GitHub, and we've tried to answer as many of them as possible. Um, 
but do start with a README file that has been updated and it has a lot more um, detail to help you get started. Um, so you can download the iOS code, uh, clone it, the Android code. Um, and um, so, so one of the things I think um, to also I just did want to mention is um, when you want to change, when you want to run the mobile app or you want to create a mobile app for your own specific study, what you really want to do is um, you you take a copy of the code base, uh, you you change the I, app icon and um, you know the, the splash screen if you like. Uh, you can also you would have to change the uh, or update the app configuration to point to the you know to the to the web services or the link or the URL that um, connect to the web services running in your environment. Uh, you can also change. Um, um, uh, style for research stack um, and uh, for research kit. Uh, so that gives you a bit of branding. You change the connectivity to the back end so it is pulling data from you know your web services or your data stores and, and the app should be ready to run. So it really, and again, that was one of the really important um, objectives when we started off building this platform that with very minimal effort, we should be able to launch an app for, for a new study. So, so this effort really is 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 very small, and it can help um, launch new studies in, in a matter of a few hours or days. Okay, so I think that is all I have. Um, please feel free to send your questions. We will answer as much of them as possible. And thank you. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand over to Adam.